That's very difficult. Uh, but on a different note, I said to him, it's Arab Roshana, and it's a lot of things to do, a lot of things to speak about. So, Ba'ezat Hashem, I'll do the best that I can without straining my voice. Baruch Atta Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam, She'akol Nihiyavit Baruch. Thank you. I apologize to the Hafez Haim that yesterday was his your side and I wasn't able to give a class in his memory, but we all know what the Hafez Haim stands for. Mi ha'ish Hafez Haim ohev yamim lirot tov. Who is the person that truly loves life, that always look at things from a positive perspective? You know, somebody mentioned to me a few moments ago, Rabbi, so many things are happening to me now. And I said to him, Baruch Hashem, you should be happy that they are happening now. I said, why? He says, very simple. Because it means that Borei Olam is checking out the year, removing all the challenges, all the headaches, to prepare you to receive all new blessings with the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, which according to the Sephardic prayers, this is one of the highlights of Rosh Hashanah. In the night of Rosh Hashanah, we will say, God willing, Tichle Shana Bekileloteha, Tahel Shana Ubirkoteha. Let the year with the headaches, challenges, and curses come to an end, let the new year with the blessings arrive to visit each and every one of us. That's on the Hafez Haim perspective. Hafez Haim, the master of Shemirat Lashon, how careful a person needs to be when they speak to measure the words, not to speak about people, not to exaggerate when talking about people, not to uh, slander, gossip, and all these things that we know the Hafez Haim is famous for. Also the Hafez Haim, the author of the Mishnah Berurah, one of the main fundamental books of Jewish law that combines the Sephardic and Ashkenazic tradition in a single book, in a clear down-to-earth sefer to understand. And definitely uh, the Kahal, uh, I'm sure, that learns the Mishnah Berurah or learn the Mishnah Berurah and the Hafez Haim. So with that being said, we move on to the next day, which is today. Today, many things are happening. I'll save my father's story towards the end. At least we'll start now, number one, with something that affects each and every one of us. Today is definitely a great day in human history, not Jewish history, but human history, because today we commemorate the beginning of the creation of the world. The Pasuk says in Sefer Bereshit, Bereshit bara Elokim et ha-shamayim be'et ha-ares. In the, create, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we have a tradition that says, Bechavhev elul nivra ha'olam. Today was the first day that the world started to be created. So you may ask, so why are we, what are we commemorating in Rosh Hashanah? The short answer is that in Rosh Hashanah, we commemorate the creation of Adam and Hava. That's the purpose of the creation of the world. The creation of the world was created for the benefit of humans, not for the benefits of animals, not for the benefits of geology or science or technology, but the, prepar the, the purpose of the creation of humans, of the world, was for mankind. But the whole way, the only way that mankind can function is if we have the Torah as part of our life. 
This is the concept that the Pasuk says, Not only that, we just read inside of the synagogue the suggested reading that Rabbi Haim Palachi writes, and it says that it's appropriate for every day from today till Rosh Hashanah, read the days of the creation of the world. It's only a suggestion, and it says read it, and there is no mezaket arabim. This is a great benefit to the kahal to understand the idea of the creation of the world. But if we look at the creation of the world, the Pasuk tells us, by Yomer Elohim Yehi Or, by He Or. Hashem said, let there be light, and the light became light. Our rabbis tell us that this light that the Torah is referring to refers to the Torah. The Pasuk says, Kiner Mizvah Ve Torah Or. The Torah is compared to the light. So therefore, light brings holiness into the world. Light of Torah brings holiness to mankind. And the Pasuk says, Bayar Elohim Kitov. The Almighty saw that the light is good. There is a Pasuk that says, Ki lekahtov natati lachem torati al tahazovu. Literally means, Ki lekahtov. I gave you a good merchandise. I gave you a good item. Do not abandon the Torah. So from here we see that how God calls Torah, Tov. The Torah is the concept of goodness. That only goodness comes to the life of the person while connected with Torah. So by Zat Hashem, every day we try to highlight one of the lessons of the creation. But it's interesting enough. I'm going to say something, but don't put it into practice. Uh, he writes behind Palachi that in Barcelona, in Spain, today was the first day of Selichot. You like it, huh? You want to go back a thousand years ago? Okay, a thousand years ago, right? No, not even Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz started already last Saturday night. Ashkenazim do four days or ten days. Depends when Rosh Hashanah falls. And in Barcelona, he writes, the tradition was to start Selichot today. Why? Because today was the creation of the world. But this was before the Shukhan Aruch was written. This was a tradition that existed in those days. Now, one more message before we switch the topic. He discusses a topic that we discussed several weeks ago in Perasha Kitese. We know that in Torah there is a mitzvah, which is not a happy mitzvah to fulfill. But it's a mitzvah that exists in the Torah. And when regretfully that mitzvah needs to be fulfilled, a person should do it accordingly. What is the mitzvah? The mitzvah of giving a get to someone's wife. Meaning to say, if God forbid a person is planning to get divorced, like a person under the chuppah gives the ketubah to his wife, when a person, God forbid, gets divorced, he must also give the get to the wife. This is called get. But on the other hand, there is a happier mitzvah than giving a get. Known has, it's not called staying married, that's obviously, obviously, but it's the concept of mahazir gerushato. Mahazir gerushato, literally it means that a person remarries his wife. There is such a mitzvah in the Torah. Remarry your original wife with two conditions. Condition number one, hold on, relax, relax, please. No, relax. No, we don't mix money and marriage. He must be very happily married, you see it. Okay? So let me explain. Number one, you're lucky we don't turn the camera to you. Maybe his wife is watching and say, what did you say in the class? All right, so we need to protect his identity. So I'll tell you two, two conditions that need to be met in order to remarry your first wife. Number one, that you are not a Kohen. If the husband is a Kohen, he cannot remarry his wife. Why? Because a Kohen is not allowed to marry a divorcee. And doesn't matter if this was your first wife or second wife, once a lady receives a get from the husband, she is forbidden to marry a Kohen. That's why there is such a thing in the halakha known as get pashut and get tafur. Get pashut 
means the divorce or every Jew. And tafur means the get of kohanim, that they used to stitch it because once the kohens get it's written and delivered, that's the end of their relationship. They can never be ever, ever again together. Now, that's condition number one, that the husband is not a kohen. Condition number two, that the wife was not married to anyone after they got divorced. Meaning to say, if the wife was married to husband one, number one, and they got divorced, and now wife married to husband number two, and she got divorced, or be she becomes a widow, halachically, she's not allowed to go back to the first husband. Because it's a, it's a concept of immorality and borderline promiscuity is not appropriate. So therefore, the Torah says, you're not allowed to do that. Now, why do we speak Erev Rosh Hashanah about this mitzvah? Why Mahazir Gerushato? So the Bihaim Palachi says, Einyana Teshuvah Hu Mahazir Gerushato. I feel that I'm straining my voice. Rabbi Haim Palachi writes that when a person does teshuva, the person is returning his divorced wife. Who is he referring to? The Pasuk writes, a man that will have two wives. Every man has two wives. Yes, ladies, I know this is shocking to you. Every man has two wives, the one that you see and the one that you don't see. Who is the wife that you see? Your physical, biological, marital relationship wife. That's called a huba. That's the love of your life. But then you have another wife. The Torah calls her senua. Who is the Torah referring to? Senua literally means like the disliked one. Who is the Torah referring to? To the neshama. You understand? A man has two wives, the physical wife and spiritual wife. If she is senua, if she is disliked by the husband, how can the second wife, the neshama, be disliked by the husband, by the man, when we don't act properly, when we commit averot? That's called senua. So what do I do now? Mahazir gerushato. I'm going to bring my wife back. Relax to the wife number one. The second wife doesn't cost any money. The second wife doesn't demand time. The second one doesn't get jealous. Has the shalom. The opposite. It says that when a person does teshuvah, he is reactivating the sanctity of the neshama, which is a fascinating word from Rabbi Haim Palachi. And therefore it says the few days pending that we have from Rosh Hashanah, return to the Almighty, which is the idea of a person preparing like a korban. Do you know, do you know why in the Ashkenazic tradition the minimum amount of selichot days are four days? Why specific four days? Why not three? Why not seven? Why not six? Short answer. Korban ta'un bedika arba'a yamim. Translation. When a person wants to offer a sacrifice in the Beit HaMikdash, it requires four days of inspections. Four days, consecutive days, we need to inspect the animal prior to offering in the Beit HaMikdash. Where do we learn it from? From the Korban Pesach. The Pasuk says, Be'asor lahodesh, on the 10th of Nisan, you will take the sacrifice and you're going to keep it in your home till Erev Pesach, till the 14th. So from here we learn that Korban ta'un bedika arba'a yamim. The minimum amount of time, and we learn that for our lesson. We, we as humans, are a godly sacrifice. With one exception. We don't have to be slaughtered. We don't have to be burned. We don't have to spill the blood. We don't have to do nothing. What do we need to do? Get closer to Hashem. Because at the end of the day, the word korban means what? Korban means a sacrifice. But the word korban in Hebrew means lekarev, to get closer to God. 
So there is no best way that a person gets closer to God when a person recognizes their shortcomings and they need to change. And by the way, that is the reason why in the Ashkenazic tradition, they do selichot for f minimum four days. This year, they need to do more because it all depends when Rosh Hashanah will happen. If Rosh Hashanah will happen on a Wednesday night, so then they will start from Saturday night. If Rosh Hashanah happens on a Sunday night like this year, so then they will start from the, Rosh Hash from the Saturday night before because they don't have the four minimum days. Imagine yourself, if Rosh Hashanah is Sunday night and they did Selichot Saturday night, that's one day, that's not enough. So they need to have minimum four days, like we must inspect an animal for offering for four days. At the end of the day, there is no much difference. And don't find this offensive, please. There is no much difference between a human and an animal. What's the difference between a human and an animal? Speech, intelligence, and freedom of choice. That's it. These are the three things that we have different from an animal. Obviously, there are many more differences, but these are the three basic ones. The basic ones in life, we do. We sleep, they sleep. We eat, they eat. They procreate, we procreate. They, 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 they rest, you know, they, they have a certain limited animalistic intelligence that enables them to act in an animalistic way. Our goal is not to act in an animalistic way, is to act like a human, to activate the wisdom, the freedom of choice, and the power of speech that we have. This is how Rabbi Haim Palachi talks about the concept of uh, preparations for Rosh Hashanah, and it says, especially in the last few days, minimize in business and increase in your godliness, meaning to say, make the proper preparations for Rosh Hashanah to revise all areas of life. He talks a lot about the topic of business. He talks about a lot of the business matter. He says, be careful that you are honest in business. Be careful there is no Shabbat desecration. Be careful that you're not shortchanging your employees. Be careful that you are honest in the way you handle with people. If it's to do with business, with measurement, all these situations, he says, make sure, make sure to clear, to clear your spiritual account from transgressions, especially when they cause Hilul Hashem or they hurt other peoples. Why? Because a person that is honest in the way of life, Tabo Alehem Birkat Tov. God will always come and bless them, etc. And he continues talking one more topic about the topic of not crying, the topic of not crying poverty. That's the topic that we discussed a few times, so I think that that's enough being said. On a different note, Today is the yard site of El Azar, the son of Aharon Akohen. Great Aharon El Azar Akohen, who was a great Kohen Gadol for Am Israel. He was the great Sadiq. And I'll tell you a quick story that I said, I think, in the, in the latest class the other day. El Azar, eh, no, Mehila. Mehila, I made a mistake. It's El Azar Akohen. Or Azar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I have a question on that. I think it's El Azar, the son of Aharon Cohen. But if I made a mistake, Hatati, Aviti, Pashati, okay? <laughs> but it's definitely El Azar. If it's El Azar Cohen or the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Elu ve Elu Divre Lokim Chaim. Both of them were great Sadikim. But I'll throw you a story of Rabbi Azar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is a story that requires a lot of emuna, because it's not a normal story. We all know very well that there was a price tag for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Rabbi El Azar. The price tag was by the Roman Empire. Why they put a price tag on this at the Kim? Because they were committing a crime against the government. They were teaching Torah. In those days, teaching Torah, living like an observant Jew, it was very dangerous. The Romans understood that as long as the Jewish people have Torah, connections to traditions, 
connection to the elders, connection to Hashem, through Shabbat, through Rosh Chodesh, through Mikveh, through Kashrut, the Jewish people will be able to survive. The Romans knew this and the Greeks knew this. So one of the decrees they made was not to study Torah. This was what happened when Rebila, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai with his son went to the Me'ara. If you remember the story, they went to the cave to learn Torah. For how many years they went to the cave? First, for 12 years. And then for an additional year. Why they went back another year? Because when they came out of the Me'ara, they saw that people were not really devoting themselves to Torah learning the way they should have been. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Mahila Rabbi Azar, any time he saw something that wasn't proper with his eyes, he will burn that something. He had like laser in his eyes. That's called holiness. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said to Rabbi Azar, you're not ready to meet the world. If you're going to destroy everything that you don't approve of, that's a problem. Go back. We need to fine tune your spiritual powers. It took an additional year to fine tune Rabbi El Azar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Fast forward. One day, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passes away. A couple of years later, Rabbi El Azar passes away. Rabbi El Azar was not buried for 28 years. He was kept in the attic of his home. He was a malach. He wasn't a person. He was a person, but he achieved such a level of godliness that burial for him was not necessary. And I'm going to tell you a few things that you may say, Rabbi, wake up. This is what happened. For 22 years, he was not buried to the point that whenever there was a challenging question for Am Israel, they will go up to the attic of the house of Rabbi El Azar and they will ask the great rabbi this question and the rabbi will nod with the head. This was Rabbi El Azar. One day, his wife goes to the attic to see how her husband is doing. He's dead. But we have a rule. Tzaddikim are not dead. This is what we need to know. That they are buried is because it's a physical need to be buried. But in his case, there was an exception. Until one day, the wife sees that in the attic, there is like a fly in the room, which is something that never happened in 28 years. The concept of uh, bugs in a grave and mosquitoes around a dead body, that's a whole different topic which I'm not going to discuss today. But the moment that she saw a fly flying around the ear of her husband, she feared that, God forbid, maybe the body started to decompose and it needed to be buried immediately. She called the Hebra Kaddisha. They took the remains of Rabbi El Azar, which is buried in Meron, next to his father, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Meron, where people go in Lagba Omer, and they buried him with great honors. But the wife was very much concerned. How could it be that for 28 years, my husband's body is not decayed, did not decompose, decompose and suddenly today, 28, 28 years later, I see a fly around his ears. And she went to sleep with this thought. Her husband, Rabbi El Azar, comes to her in a dream. And she says, don't worry. So she says, why the fly? It says very simple. One day, I was running late to go to learn Torah. And I ran through the flea market, he says. And I heard, I heard how two Yehudim were talking Lashon Ara about another Yehudi. My ears listened to the Lashon Ara and I stayed quiet. I ignored it and I continued running. Today, they were judging me 
for a lashon hara that I heard on the go. Powerful story. We leave it like that. We leave it like that. If today is the your side, so I'm happy that I share a story. And if today was not the your side, I'll tell a story in honor of Rabbi Azar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, on a different note, and I would I like to verify the day because I'm curious. You have it? Oh, he's getting it, the your side list from the Sadiqim. Also, uh, today, my father's your side, David Ben Esther, Alava Shalom. Uh, I don't think that anyone in this room met my father or knew my father, but uh, many people of the shul at large knew my father already from Argentina and Brazil. A, a wonderful person. Thank you so much. Aha, beautiful. Baruch Hashem. I'm so happy that I was correct. Fifth, yes, today, Tana of Rabbi El Azar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So we are okay with the story? We are happy? I'm so happy. Thank you. Just one second. Just one second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Anyways, let's continue. So my father born in Egypt, like some of our members. Your mother too. Beautiful. Okay, yeah. And they lived in Egypt, I believe, till 1950. That's when I believe they, they were able to receive uh, visas uh, to Uruguay. And how they got the visas, probably my uncles and aunts uh, can tell us more details. But if I remember from childhood, I think my grandfather, Alava Shalom, in Egypt had a factory of uh, glasses and windows. And one day I think he got a, a, an opportunity to install windows by the Uruguayan embassy in Egypt. And I believe that in lieu of payment, they got visas for the family, which it was a common trade in the olden days. I don't think that the ambassador of Uruguay in Egypt spoke Arabic, but my grandparents originally came from Turkey and they spoke Ladino which is the Spanish version of the Sephardic uh, world, especially in those days. And somehow, somewhere, uh, this is how they got to Uruguay, leaving behind all their assets, including the Rolls Royce in the driveway, and the house, and the factory. Mamash, they walked, you know, in Spanish we say, una mano atrás, una mano adelante. Literally, empty-handed, you know, they were living two at a time, not to create any suspicious, especially that this was immediately after the foundation of the state of Israel. And therefore, there was, you know, things, sounds of war, etc. So Baruch Hashem, they made it to Uruguay. From Uruguay, my father, Alava Shalom, was the only one who went to Argentina. There he met my mother, and this, that's where he started to develop with my mother a more of a Torah observant. They were traditional, very traditional, respectful of the traditions, but obviously Egypt in those days, I don't believe that they have yeshivot. They did not have yeshivot or kolelim. They have a ketab, they have the alions, I believe, that everybody went through, and that was the, 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 the level of Judaism that they had. But Baruch Hashem, when they came to Argentina, when he came to Argentina, he became part of the Syrian community. That's where he met my mother. That's where he married my mother. And eventually, uh, we moved to Brazil. And eventually, he moved to Israel after his uh, retirement. The move from Argentina to Brazil was business related by the company that he worked with in Argentina. Uh, many of you know the 
Sultan, Shaul Sultan Dabah, Alev Shalom, in the world of perfume, which I believe you know him very well. So my father worked with them close to 40 years. And the last chapter of their business relationship was the move to Brazil. My father had a great a kavod, kavod and emunat hachamim. Whatever big decision came to make in our life, in his life, in our life, always was preceded by let me ask the rabbi. Let me check the hacham, whichever hacham it was. If it was hacham shevar or hacham abdel haq or other hachamim that were part of our life, uh, especially from 1970 till almost the year 2000, always connected to Hachamim. My father was, Baruch Hashem, a wonderful and successful uh, businessman. Uh, generosity was part of our DNA. Baruch Hashem, anyone who came and asked for help, received their help. And uh, it comes finally, he makes Aliyah to Israel. I think this was in the late 1990s. And uh, he had a mission. One of the reasons why he moved to Israel, it was, he told me, this personally, so he says to me that the day that he needs to meet the Creator, he should be already living in Israel and not to come as a transport from a coffin in an airline. This was his idea. He learned Torah, he supported Torah, and again, that didn't minimize him being a very good businessman and knowing a lot of languages, which I believe that was something very common from the Egyptian background, that languages was a multi-benefit uh, that they had, learning Arabic, Spanish, Italian, English, French, uh, and Ladino, and, and Greek, I think, I believe, because that was basically what happened in those days. So his final day in this world, I'll tell you what happened. I'm in America, he's in Israel. So usually, he, he will call us Sunday noontime, early afternoon, to see how was Shabbat. How did we do a Shabbat? What did we do, etc. And that day, he went to shul for Selichot. He went to pray in the morning. He called all the children Sunday, Israel time. He went to the Knis, Minha and Arvit. He said Shema. He put on pajamas. He said Shema. And he lay down in the couch. And this is how he left the world. Mamash, unbelievable. Although he's sad, but I, I'm thinking retroactively. It's already 19 years. And I get a phone call from my, my brother-in-law. And he tells me about my father. And he says, impossible. I spoke to him two hours ago, three hours ago. This was maybe 7 o'clock Miami time. So I spoke to him like 2, 3 o'clock, if not later. He says, this is what happened. Come. So Baruch Hashem, I went. I paid the respect. I did whatever I needed to do. But definitely my father, Aleva Shalom, was a person that, he loved to serve the community, who always tried to apply whatever he learned. I said before, he did not have a yeshiva background. He had a business background, he had an intellectual background, but he did not have a yeshiva background. Not that he went to learn to yeshiva after, but whenever there was a Torah class, he will be there. Whenever there was a shiur in the knees, he will come. Yes, he traveled a lot for business. I will tell you that. His parnasa was traveling all over the world, the way it used to be many years back. But nevertheless, he always traveled with his Korach. He always found a shoe. He always brought with him kosher food. In those days, you have to bring tuna and sardines and different things. Remember those days? Kosher food. You got you to gotta pack your stuff. And Baruch Hashem, I cannot complain. He provided for us in a beautiful way. And he took care of us at all levels. And, you know, we saw love and respect. 
and, and harmony in our home. We saw great respect to the elders, great respect to the parents, great respect to the hachamim. And as I said before, whenever he became aware of something new, he will find a way of how to bring it into his life, which at the end reciprocated into our daily life. And thank God, it wasn't done in a forceful way, the opposite. We grew up that way. When he passed away, very young, 68. Very young. But you know what? Retroactively, he passed away in the year 2000. Yes. Retroactively, you know, concerning the age aspect, it's young. But he lived a full life. Baruch Hashem. Despite a couple of hiccups through life, which we all have, but Baruch Hashem, you know, we, are, we have no claims against God, for the record. We are thankful for every day. We are thankful for every lesson. And we definitely remember him vividly. But I'm going to tell you the craziest thing. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I'll tell you two, three stories quickly. That Shabbat, he passed away Sunday evening. That Shabbat, my cousins from New Jersey came to visit my parents. Out of nowhere, my parents live in Kiryat Malachi. They were visiting, I think, Jerusalem. And they say, you know what? Let's go to Uncle David's house. I believe they spent Shabbat there. And Mosei Shabbat comes. And then uh, my cousin says, let's take a picture. And they took pictures of my parents. I'm going to take the liberty of showing you the picture that was taken less than 24 hours prior, prior to his passing. Here, let me put it in the zoom. You see it? That's my mother, may she be well. And on her side, obviously, is my father. This was my father's picture. Less than 24 hours, he left the world. Look good. Look very happy. He did not have a beard during his years of business, by the way. He grew the beard much later in life. But you know what? Baruch Hashem. I'm only thankful for all my life experiences. I'll tell you, one, I'll tell you two, two quick stories. I'll tell you three or four maybe. But this is part of the kavod to a father, right? So I'll tell you, I said this Shabbat afternoon, when the need to move to Brazil in 1979 came, everything was set up. Move, factory, home, whatever you need was there. He goes to the rabbi in Argentina and asks the rabbi for a blessing. And the rabbi asked him, before I give you the blessing, tell me how you're going to handle your spiritual life. This was the rabbi's question to my father. He said, what's the question? What about schools for the boys, for the girls? So my father gave a whole report to the great rabbi. And he says, what about Yosef? What about me? I was a teenager. I was in high school in Argentina, in the Syrian high school. Yes, so that that. Hacham Shevan, Allah v'shalam. And he says, I'll find something. I'll, 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 I'll. He was very hesitant. The rabbi did not like that answer. The rabbi said to my father, your son, listen to this, stays in Argentina with me. He doesn't go to Brazil with you. My father said, okay, rabbi, amen. The rabbi said, not amen, go speak to your wife. We need to have your wife's approval. You know what it means for a Syrian mother that her beautiful firstborn son, remove the word beautiful, but the firstborn son, Yosef, 
is going to stay in Argentina alone, has it, haram, how he's going to survive, ta, 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 ta. To make a long story short, my father went to my mother, and my mother agreed for me to stay in Argentina. If the rabbi is going to take care of our son, we're living without him. This was me when I was 15 years old. My brother, Eli, sometimes he's watching the class, and my sisters, they had good Torah education in Brazil for them, for their age. But in 1979, all the boys from a Torah background, they will leave Brazil after Bar Mitzvah. There was nothing for them to learn in a Torah high school. They will send them to Baltimore, they will send them to Cleveland, to Israel, to America, different places. To make a long story short, we did not have that mindset yet of traveling overseas. And this was the normal way in San Pablo back in the late 70s. Fast forward today, the 21st century, already for many years, Brazil changed. Brazil has a lot of Torah institutions. Brazil has a lot of yeshivot, kolelim, mikvaot, kosher restaurants. Nothing is lacking today. Sure, sure, obviously. Nothing is lacking for the spiritual life today. But in those days, the resources were very, very limited. So I stayed in Argentina. I lived in someone's home for two and a half years, until I came to America, 1982. But you need to know the following. High school and yeshiva in Argentina finished nine o'clock at night from 7.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. 7.30 started. So I woke up at 6, get ready, take the bus to go to school, and come back at 9 o'clock. Where I lived, which I had very comfortable living quarters, somebody had two apartments attached. The kitchen was safe for Pesach. That's what they did. And they, they had a bedroom with a bathroom, with a shower, and the dining room, all for me. And the person refused to take one cent from my parents. He says, no, the rabbi told me that I need to help you. I'm going to help you all the way. No compensation. My gifts to them was uh, my parents in those days, my mother, not my father. My mother, to keep herself busy, uh, my father bought for her a kosher bakery in San Pablo. My father was very busy with the company. My mother, the, all the kids were in school, new country. Let me get busy with something productive. My father bought a bakery and they used to manufacture the best kosher chocolates in South America. So my gift to them was always to bring them a couple of pounds of chocolate. And that was their compensation. They did not want to take one cent. But I need to tell you one thing. To my mazal, the husband of this family that I lived used to go to learn to the synagogue every night from 8 to 11 o'clock at night. 10.45 will be Arvit, and at 11 he will come back home. So that creates for me a problem. I couldn't be in his home because his wife is at home with a baby or two children so I cannot be home. So what did I do? From my finished high school and yeshiva, I went to the knis to wait for him till 11 o'clock at night to come back home to sleep. Unbelievable. So what did I do? The first month, I took a nap in the shul, in the couch. But then I said to my father, you know what? I'm going to sleep later. Let's find out if I'm able to find a teacher to teach me English from 9.30 at night till 10.30 at night. Guess what? We found one. And this is how I learned English. When I was 15 years old, was my first lesson in English, although the high school gave us English, but it was very limited. This was intense. Put it yourself. 
four nights a week, an hour at night. This is how I learned English. So when I came to America three years later almost, my English was good. Not as good as now, but it was very comfortable to engage in a conversation and Baruch Hashem, you know, thank God. This is my childhood, my teenage years, intense, and I'm not complaining, and I'm only sharing this to you, A, because it's my father's your side, and to understand how Akadosh Baruch Hu creates so many situations in a person's life, and a person must recognize that every situation is the same sender, HaKadosh Baruch. I'll tell you one story, and will this will finish. This story was told to me during the week of the Shiva of my father. Okay? As I said to you before, my father was a good Jew, loved people, respected people, kind, generous, a true believer. For him, doing an extra mitzvah or learning how to do a mitzvah better, it wasn't for what? The opposite. So one day, you saw his, the way he looks, right? With a beard, etc. And one day, he comes from the knis back home. And a lady from the building sees my father that's coming from the knis with the koracha. And she says to him, uh, Don David, Mr. David, give a blessing to my baby. The baby was born a few weeks ago. The Mila took place in the building last week. So my father, in a humble way, said, you know what? If you want a blessing, go to the Hacham of the Knis. He's there now. He's going to give you a blessing. I don't feel comfortable to give blessings. That's what my father said to this lady. My father walks from the lobby to the elevator. And then he comes down outside of the building. And on the way to the elevator, he changed his mind. He said to himself, the Mishnah writes in Pirkei Avot, never undermine the blessing of a simple person. So he said, you know what? What's the worst thing that happened? That the blessing doesn't materialize? He comes back and he says to her, Please pick up the baby from the stroller. I will give him a blessing. And you need to believe this. This conversation took place outside of the lobby. You know that in Israel, they have the balconies, right? So they are standing in front. The moment that my father picks the baby or the mother picks the baby and gives the baby to my father, on that instant, a planter falls from the sixth floor balcony into the baby's stroller. No coincidence. We don't believe in coincidence. We believe in divine providence. I did not know this story until the Shiva. A lady comes in and he says, are you the son of David? I said, yes. What is your name? She tells me her name. Says, really, I don't know you. Says, I know you don't know me, but I knew your father very well. And she tells me, your father was a big sadiq. I said, yeah, of course, I know that. You know, as a good son. She says, no, 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 no. You don't know what happened with him a few weeks ago. And what happened after that? From that moment, every time people will see my father in the building, they will say, the miracle worker, Give me a blessing. Okay? And my father was an, an, a nice, good character fellow. And Baruch Hashem, you know, he left a Shem Tov. He left a good name, Baruch Hashem. And uh, I'm thankful. I'm thankful to Akadosh Baruch Hu for, for the years that he gave me. But there is an important factor with him that we need, I need to remember. And we all need to remember. Hamavdil. If it would have not been for my mother's support and dedication, who knows if things would have been the same. We have to understand, 
that although we're talking about my father today, but it takes two rotango, you know. So by Ezat Hashem, the Neshama uh, should have an aliyah in Gan Eden. And uh, basically, I think that with this, I'll conclude today's class. And by Ezat Hashem, his Neshama uh, should have an aliyah. And by Ezat Hashem, may he pray for everybody's welfare. Today is Bereshit. Today is a new renewal in Gan Eden. So very special day, very powerful day, not only for me because of my father, but actually for each and every one of us. Today is Bereshit bara Elohim. Today is the beginning of the creation. Today is an opportunity to close the last chapter and to begin a new chapter in our life. So we're going to say Kaddish and Ashkava right away. Baruch Adonai Le'Olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer, Ratza Kadosh Baruch Hu lezakot et Israel lefichach. Irba lehem Torah Mizvot sheneemar Adonai Hafez leman sitko yagdil Torah ve'yadir il gadal ve'it kadash shemer abba ve'alma diverach ilote ve'yamlech machute ve'yatzma purkane ve'karem meshiche ve'hayechon u'yamechon u'hayem dechol ve'et Israel ba'agala u'bizman karib b'imru. Amen. יהי שמה רבה מברך לעלם ולעלמי עלמיה יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם וינסה ויתדר תלוי ותלל